let me turn to Emily again on an area where you personally have deep expertise, which is diversity and inclusion. Okay. Talk to us about diversity and inclusion, um, how your members think about it, how your own work uh, addresses it, and what, what impact is that having on private equity and on companies that are owned by private equity uh, funds? Sure. Um, and um, interestingly enough, when I, I started and was talking about the geographic differences in ESG approaches, I had said that, you know, that kind of started in Europe. Uh, for diversity and inclusion, it's really being driven here in the U.S. And I really believe strongly that uh, a lot of the movement after the what I'm calling the Me Too summer um, of 2017 um, started to take place. And, it, um, and, and this time it feels different. I've been in venture capital private equity since uh, early 2000. And, um, and there's a lot of sustainability around the diversity and inclusion efforts that are going on today. And uh, we at ILPA didn't have a diversity and inclusion strategy uh, in the summer of 2017 when um, the binary capital uh, scandal, the New York Times uh, story came out. And we very quickly said, number one, they're gonna ver the press is gonna not only start asking the portfolio companies and the general partners what they're doing to fix this, but then they're gonna ask the LPs what they're doing to fix this. Um, there's a common phrase that oh, nothing's going to change until the LPs demand that it happens because the LPs have all the money and we will, we will say to the GPs, we're not going to give you any money unless you do this, this, and this. And in reality, um, private equity returns are, are doing so well and, or, and the general partners are doing so well that we actually don't have that power. So limited partners are not able on our own to say, you know, you need to diversify your teams. You need to have ESG strategies, um, but we but we are able to work together with our general partners, and I do uh, use the term partner really wholeheartedly to make advances in DNI, and um, many of the largest firms are really trying to do things differently, and trying to attract and retain um, more women, more people of color, more minorities. Uh, looking to make sure that their investment teams are diversified. And, and we as LPs are asking the questions. So um, in 2018, uh, we have a standard due diligence questionnaire that we have on our website. You can go look at it. And we added a whole section on diversity and inclusion, asking uh, what the makeup is, what the uh, promotion and attrition rates are for women and minorities. We have a template where you can uh, list your, uh, your staff uh, based on seniority. On, um, on by position. Uh, some of our members actually asked uh, general partners to list uh, uh, their staff um, based on compensation, women and minorities, and, and they're getting that information. So we're, we're starting to ask the questions. It's starting to be a more common conversation during the due diligence uh, uh, process, and, uh, and, and we're starting to see change, and nobody's letting up this time. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see it. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that I'll say um, is that it's really important that we all take a positive, not punitive approach at this early, and I'd say it's an early stage. It's, we've been doing this for years, so I, I don't mean to say that we haven't been trying to do this for years, but, um, but penalizing a, a general partner because you, know, uh, you don't have enough uh, women or minorities on your team today, uh, is not going to help anybody. But if that general partner isn't doing anything or can't point to anything that they're trying to do to make a difference, then that's when you can start making some decisions based on that, uh, you know, lack of uh, enthusiasm for, for some very, very important change. Thanks, Emily. And I would refer you all to the st standards you've published recently. Just this summer, I believe, you, you published an updated version of your Standard principles, is it? Uh, yeah. So the ILPA principles is a it, it's a very it's a forty page document on how GPs and LPs should work together, and uh, there's absolutely ESG threaded throughout that uh, that document. There are, are some DNI uh, issues, but there's also a lot of stuff on uh, you know governance and uh, limited partnership agreements. And if you're Want some good bedtime reading? I highly recommend it. <laughs> Love that. Well, let's let's see if there are questions now from the audience. Uh, let if you could raise your hand so I can get a sense of. Can I just them. make one comment? Of course, Donna. Please. So do. I wanted to just uh, back Emily up here because um, I've been around a long time too, and I, when this first started coming, I said I've seen this movie before, right? Uh, but it does feel different this time. Uh, I will say that, and. Uh, 
I'm very happy to report that we here at Columbia Business School do a lot of research on <coughs> diversity and inclusion because I think a lot of this has to do with educating people. And there's lots of academic research which suggests that diverse teams make better decisions. And with business as global as it is, it, it, it's so important to have a diverse team, not just so you can check the box and you say this, but you actually make better decisions having that, having that happen. And I can think of no better business than sort of private equity where you're dealing with other people and having to make judgments about character and things like that and having a variety of inputs is incredibly important. So thanks for saying that. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you that it is definitely different this time. But I think that, I, and I, I think that's great, you don't ding people for, you know, you don't have the requisite number of X because that's not what it's about. It's, it's going to drive returns when you have a broader point of view on making a decision. And on the theme of it being different this time, uh, in the students that you deal with, mm -hmm. do you see the students being more focused on this than before? I think w we are making more outreach. We just finished our KKR uh, case writing competition, on, and, and it was a KKR case writing competition, diversity and inclusion. So the teams were also rated on the uh, diversity of their team uh, in terms of thought, not just having business school students, not having, you know, so it was, and it was, it's really interesting. This is the second year we've done it with uh, KKR. KKR came to us two years ago to do it, and it was with great trepidation we did it because the business school students will tell you that they're, they're busy 24-7 and I'm like, oh my gosh, how are we going to field teams? We had you know, over 30 teams of people do, it, do the competition, so it was really quite amazing. So I think the students take it seriously and I'm starting to see the, the um, PE firms take it very seriously. Um, on the ESG specialist side, um, I think that um, I think that they're coming from a lot of different places. Um, it, it is a newer uh, position within these organizations. The um, the heads of VSG, the heads of DNI, are are coming um, uh, largely on the DNI. They're coming more from uh, HR backgrounds, I, I believe, or um, study of uh, human resources. Um, on ESG, they can come from sustainability backgrounds. They can come from environmental analysis backgrounds. They can also come from financial backgrounds. And the ability to apply a financial mindset to some of these uh, these risks that are out there um, is also a, a really great uh, uh, trait and characteristic to bring to any table. So uh, the retention and promotion uh, question. Um, absolutely imperative in any kind of DNI strategy and uh, you know, a lot of folks are focused on getting the numbers and the diversity and getting the people in um, but it's not going to help if once they're there they don't feel like they belong and don't feel like uh, they're a part of the organization so um, we at ILPA are actually working on a, a long-term project and, and they're, they're two separate projects but one's on ESG and one's on DNI but we're creating a roadmap for limited partners and general partners to uh, build their own adventures in both of these spaces if they want to advance either their ESG or DNI strategies. And on the DNI, um, there is a specific um, chapter in that roadmap on uh, retention and inclusion. And that, you know, that has to do with um, if you're large enough having affinity groups at the organization that uh, address uh, the, the needs of uh, uh, minorities within the organization. It's about mentorship. Um, it's about uh, family lead policy and making sure that uh, folks can uh, leave and, and uh, you know, have a child or care for a, an older parent and be able to come back to a job and not be penalized for it, both uh, men and women. Um, it's about um, uh, promotion and making sure that everybody has an opportunity to be promoted. So lots of initiatives that can be taken and we're absolutely looking at that as much as we're looking at pipeline and other things. And then the diversity and inclusion, I think that there's, I mean, I think time takes time. And uh, I've always found, because when I, I went into the practice of law, because I had a life before uh, being on Wall Street and as a banker, uh, you know, they would talk a great game, but you didn't see a lot of women partners, you know, and you don't see people like you there as a junior person. And I think that really affects the retention question. Um, so now law schools are about 50-50. Uh, when I went to law school, it wasn't. It was about you know 30, and business school when I went here was about 20 percent, right? Uh, and so time takes time, but you do need to see people like you. I find it's not just enough to have a great crop of junior people and say, okay, we're going to bring them up because they're like, I don't believe you. I don't see you know. And also, you know, the interesting thing too, which there's academic research on, is that I always found I could talk from my own experience. 
men and women, at least in investment banking, I found sell differently. So when I would go out and pitch business uh, to clients, uh, and I would have a male uh, supervisor, managing director, he'd be like, oh, you didn't ask for the ticket. Or, you know, he would, he would impose how he would think about selling the deal, right, uh, on me. And I'm like, we're going to get the deal. Don't worry. So I think it, it's interesting because people, if you don't have people like you in the organization, people sometimes are not evaluating you appropriately because things that work for, some people don't work for other people, you know, and I think so it's very important from a variety of uh, metrics to have a diverse a group. And so I think we'll get there, but I think it's going to take a little bit of time. And everything starts with a step. And I, and I agree with Emily uh, that this time it definitely is different. I can't tell you how quickly it's going to happen, but I think this has legs, as they say.